bioinformatics or or something but um somebody kind of pointed me in the direction of this strange course at the royal college of art um called design interactions which was this kind of uh course which was uh trying to um you know uh sort of approach science and technology from a kind of artistic design critical design standpoint um and there finally i sort of you know felt at home um so uh yes as um anna mentioned my kind of graduating project on that course was this project to try and make an electric toaster from scratch um and you know that involved various kind of you know, uh, trips to mines and, you know, kind of plastic factories and, you know, over nine months trying to kind of uh, recreate this uh, mundane object from raw materials and basically trying to recreate the, the Iron Age and the kind of Bronze Age and the Plastic Age. And uh, this was kind of the result of my efforts um, and, you know, a kind of absurdly expensive, terrible electric toaster, um, but, you know, made completely by me. Um, so that was some years ago now. <laughs> More recently, I've been... Um, uh, working on a project um, uh, with a, um, a, a kind of professor at um, Imperial College, um, Naomi Nakayama, um, and uh, you know I've been trying to make prosthetics for trees. Um, basically, I wanted to keep alive uh, some tree branches when they've been severed from the the trunk of the tree. Um, and that's a kind of interesting uh, but kind of difficult uh, project. Um, and I'm also about to go and do a residency um, at Artist Zoo in Amsterdam um, with a uh, kind of um, a organization called Machine Wilderness. And uh, they asked me what I wanted to do. And I said I wanted to make a harmless car. Um, and, you know, there's a sort of a backstory to this idea, but I don't know what it's going to look like exactly. Um, this is somebody else's, it's going to look like something like that. I'm kind of collaborating with a um, professor at uh, Delft University of Technology because I want to weave the chassis of the car. That's what I'm going to be doing at Artist Zoo. Obviously, it's takes a long time to, uh, there's a lot in a car, so I'm just going to focus on the chassis at this zoo, and I'm going to weave it out of, um, out of uh, willow, um, because I kind of think that that's probably the most harmless kind of chassis I can do. I've kind of collaborating with a professor, uh, John Wu, at Elft University to kind of uh, work out the, the kind of most optimized weaving pattern for this willow um and so uh yeah it's kind of i guess it's sort of a ancient weaving technique sort of combined with like a you know a computer optimization process um and i'm not sure what the car will look like hopefully it will look a little bit more kind of car like than this but it's kind of that's the general aim um <laughs> so that's what I'm up to at the moment. But um, when Anna kind of got in touch, she briefly mentioned um, what your kind of project is. Um, and it's sort of, you know, this um, kind of alternate possibilities um, around evolution. Uh, and it's kind of something I've been interested in myself a little bit. Um, and uh, the, uh, so I'm going to talk through a few of these projects, um, which also kind of talk about deep time and technology. Um, and I think it's the kind of theme that I kind of go back to quite often. Um, and I think it is basically, uh, you know, because I'm sort of curious about, you know, my small sort of uh, lifetime in this kind of you know endless 
endless amount of time in you know the past and in the future and a project i did to try and you know at least kind of understand where i fit not in deep time but just in kind of history was i just you know made some wallpaper um but this wallpaper is kind of was like the inspiration was a sort of year to view wall planner um you know which you kind of you see in offices uh, and it presents a whole year just you know uh on the wall and uh i find it kind of a little bit disturbing but so i made a kind of lifetime to view or sort of uh lifetime to view wall planner basically um but this this kind of wall planner each you know each uh kind of row is a is a whole year and this thing extends sort of 200 years into the future and 200 years into the past and you you know your lifetime is just a kind of small amount of wall about you know 80 80 rows high um so uh yes and i've kind of returned to the sort of this theme a few times um this was a project commissioned um by fact in manchester um and uh you, you know they were putting on a show in some caverns and um and uh i proposed this project that i would kind of try and return some um kind of technology to the sort of geology from which it came so i uh dissolved some you know various tech technology hard disks in in acid and then um and then using those salts okay. um i kind of precipitated out these hard drives in the kind of in the form of geology in these kind of stalagmites and stalactites um and i suppose it was a way of trying to think about you know the kind of the traces that technology leaves on geology or the the kind of uh and sort of thinking about post post industrial pollution um and sort of you know when all of this is forgotten all of these you know these kind of wonderful objects that we use every day will ultimately just kind of go back into the earth um so uh yes so you know a kind of cyclical process i suppose um and another project um that sort of i've done in in my kind of in my career since leaving um uh the rca is another work um which kind of began with this sort of you know the sense that we get when we look at you know these historic films um and you know they're all kind of black and white um but they're sort of familiar because you know this is london obviously um and uh you know in the early days of cinema um and we try and imagine ourselves in these kind of grainy black and white images um and i sort of was wondering well you know will you know our kind of ancestors in the future will they get a similar kind of feeling of like um of the sublime um or you know of of, of sort of uh the sort of strangely familiar um feeling that we get when we look at these images of charing cross station i was there just the other day uh, will they get a kind of similar sort of feeling when they you know look at our early attempts at virtual reality and all the kind of media that we're like generating today you know how will they kind of archive it how will they relate to um the archives of this material so i kind of made up this sort of uh slightly ridiculous um you know kind of documentary from the future sort of um uh talking about you know our present um from the perspective of the far future but kind of using this like grainy early vr stuff um the number of animals an individual or group controlled had long been the main indication of wealth and power 
I should say also, you know, in the same way that we condense, you know, a period of 200 years to a kind of a brief, um, like, paragraph, you know, in, uh, you know, in a book about human history, I also quite liked the idea of, you know, all of, you know, our kind of, you know, in industrial revolution and kind of the advent of computing i quite liked the idea that that will you know it seems so revolutionary and important to us but i quite liked the idea that that would just be kind of condensed along with you know the um sort of like <laughs> advent of of farming or whatever um into a sort of you know uh, a couple of sentences and so that's what that's the perspective i'm trying to um kind of conjure in the uh in the uh voiceover um by the way just to check you can hear the sound from these videos right you're gonna have to say yes or no yes yes okay yes. great yes. just checking thank you the number of animals an individual or group controlled had long been the main indication of wealth and power. Status was also commonly displayed by occupying coveted buildings in certain physical places or by owning high-value material tools or decorative objects. For example, the ability to travel quickly and in isolation was highly prized. Their roads were crowded with vehicles, each one powered by hydrocarbons and operated by a human occupant. These lethal machines were found in even the farthest reaches of the civilization. The status of a vehicle's occupant was indicated through a complex interplay of external signals. The most prominent of these signals was the overall color of the vehicle. Gold vehicles were rare and highly prized, reserved for higher status individuals, whereas white, red and black vehicles were common and clearly of lower status. The golden vehicle in front must be operated by a particularly powerful individual. The vehicle we've caught, however, is white and hence of low status. Anyway. This is a low status vehicle. It is small. And anyway, slightly laboring the point. But, um, yes, so uh, kind of, I guess I'm sort of like going through my own archive here, but um, uh, another project um, that kind of relates to sort of deep time and certainly to alternate kind of histories um, or counterfactual histories was a project where I got interested in the question of, well, you know, counterfactual histories. Um, you know, what if Hitler had been kind of born a, a you know, a female? Um, but I got interested in the question of, OK, well, if we can imagine kind of counterfactual histories or alternate realities um, in the kind of social sciences realm, I was wondering, could we um, imagine an alternate kind of history of science, uh, uh, an alternate history of science that would be kind of no less true in a sense but would nonetheless be kind of radically different to, you know, the kind of history of science that we're familiar with. Um, and, you know, so to, to sort of answer that question, I, you know, uh, you, you know, I, I tend to go and interview sort of experts in, you know, in these kind of offices uh, that they kind of, you know, and the sort of offices and universities um, around the place. Um, and you know ask them kind of questions like is science true um and you know get some quite interesting answers but the, the um particular sort of track i took with this project was focusing on jean baptiste lamarck and if you kind of you know remember your history of science um lamarck uh proposed a um you know an alternative uh, answer to the question of you know why are there how and why are there kind of so many species on the planet um and of course this question was wrapped up in uh questions of you know uh 
for him and for many others like uh faith and you know uh kind of uh and god as like this you know did god put all the the animals here um and so lamarck's answer for the question of you know why we have so many species was well uh species gradually change um driven by an inner need um and so the classic example is uh a, a giraffe you know um a fossil giraffe uh you know started started with a kind of fairly normal size neck but you know as the giraffe ancestors kind of uh you know stretched for leaves higher and higher on the tree driven by this inner need you know their necks gradually lengthened during their own lifetime and that kind of lengthening was passed on to their children so it's kind of the inheritance of acquired characteristics um and of course you know now with kind of Darwinian evolution, we think, oh, yes, that's kind of very ridiculous. But of course, at the time, these two paradigms were kind of equally, um, you know, uh, sort of at one point kind of equally um, regard, well regarded. Um, but um, nowadays, you know, there is a kind of a, you know, a, a perhaps a paradigm shift in, in process, in progress. Um, as the focus moves away from kind of DNA um, and sort of classical genetics to looking at, you know, um, uh, epigenetics and, uh, you know, this idea that actually what we do in our lifetimes can affect, um, you know, our kind of children, you know, these kind of acquired characteristics can be passed on. Um, and so I tried to imagine what if Darwin had kind of slipped and fallen uh, as he kind of got off the, uh, the beagle and, you know, unfortunately cracked his head open on a rock as he stepped onto the shores of the Galapagos. And I kind of tried to put this in sort of choose your own history of science book um and uh also kind of made these sort of objects uh which were meant to um kind of portray this sort of this kind of you know counter you know this alternate reality which was born off a kind of a uh um which was born off a lamarckian Kind of history of science um and uh i won't kind of go into the details but you know in this kind of alternate reality uh there was no schism between kind of the sort of uh sciences and uh kind of religion um and uh so we had these sort of you know attempts to become angelic beings by the kind of uh you know more extreme members of um the sort of <laughs> kind of science church um and you know one and and uh you know we had objects like this this baby scarer to try and um work out if a child was kind of susceptible to uh you know passing their kind of acquired characteristics on to their own children but the thing with alternate histories is they quickly become very complex that's kind of my uh, a little warning for the students watching this um talk um so uh, perhaps we can discuss that in the questions but the last project that i will kind of quickly talk about um is a project i did a few years ago which anna mentioned which was my attempt to try and become a goat um and this kind of was driven by a question um and i asked myself this question when i was looking after this dog noggin and it was a kind of period in my life when i was feeling a little bit kind of upset and cross and depressed um you know money worries kind of family worries etc cetera, etc cetera. um and i had this um this you know kind of thought that noggin 
um, you know, this dog that I was looking after. Um, you're so lucky. You don't have to deal with any of this stuff. Wouldn't it be nice to be you? Um, and this question um, has been kind of asked by philosophers, uh, you know, over the years. This is John Stuart Mill um, asking a similar question. You know, wouldn't it be nice to just be a pig? and to you know wallow around not not having to deal with all the complexity of being a human um john stuart mill you know in his utilitarian philosophy was always like yes it's always better to be the socrates it's always you, you have to face face up to things it's always better to know nonetheless Hawking has a very nice life um, and I kind of started thinking, wouldn't it be nice to at least have a holiday from all of this kind of human, from, from all these human troubles? Wouldn't it be nice to just gallop away? Um, and it became a bit of a dream. And then I wrote a funding application to the Wellcome Trust um, uh, saying I would like to become an elephant. And to my surprise, they you know, said, OK, off you go. Um, and so they, they gave me some money to become an elephant. And I quickly realized that actually kind of trying to become an elephant to escape human worries uh, was not the right thing to do um, because it turns out elephants are one of the only other species that seem to understand their own mortality. Um, and they live in these kind of complex families um, and kind of, complex family was exactly the try, kind of thing I was trying to escape from. So I, uh, you know, was sort of relaying this, you know, my woes uh, to a friend. I've got all this money to become an elephant and I don't want to be an elephant anymore. What do I do? And she suggested I go and visit an expert in human and animal transformations. Um, and she put me in touch with a shaman friend of hers. Um, and uh, I went to visit Annette, uh, this, uh, this shamanic practitioner. Um, and, uh, you know, she sat me down and said, of course you can't be an elephant, Thomas. You need to become a goat. Um, and she also pointed out that, you know, my idea to, you know, try and take holiday from from being a human was not a new idea at all and in fact you know people have probably been um kind of trying to become non-human animals for you know almost as long as you know we've been human beings and this is the oldest image of a human animal hybrid um kind of we think anyway um found so far um recently uh, carbon dated to 44,000 years ago um, uh, and it's on a cave in a wall uh, on a wall in a cave in uh, Sulwesi in Indonesia um, and this is the um, oldest uh, figurative sculpture ever discovered um, carved um, about 40,000 years ago from mammoth ivory um, and you can kind of fast forward to today and we're still kind of grappling with, you know, what makes us different from animals. Um, and I took this approach again of kind of, you know, going to visit experts to, you know, ask them, you know, how I could transform myself into a goat. This is a goat behavioral psychologist who took me to visit his research subjects um, at Buttercup Sanctuary for Goats, this lovely goat sanctuary. Um, and I asked him what makes me different from a human. And he said, well, we don't know and we may never actually be able to find out, but our current best guess is humans have this kind of ability to speak obviously and we also have this kind of ability to think in stories you know uh kind of scenarios um and uh you know our hopes and our kind of regrets are all kind of stories um so i went to a, a neuroscientist and said could you switch off my ability to speak and to think in stories um and he said i could but i'd have to 
remove about two thirds of your brain. So he ended up, ended up instead uh, inducing virtual lesions in the parts of my brain that let that let me kind of vocalise. Those it could be. Um, who's that trip trapping over my bridge? Said the dog. Fair. Yeah. Um, you know, unpleasant kind of worked but he you know said come back in 50 years and i might make be able to make you kind of believe you're a goat um the body um i thought was going to be easy I just kind of went into the workshop and started like making some sort of exoskeletons that would let me kind of gallop along um unfortunately it quickly sort of proved more difficult than i had sort of at first thought um and uh so again what am i doing wrong i went to visit a um a professor who had worked on the kind of darpa early stage darpa um boston dynamics kind of running um robots and said you know if you can make a robot kind of you know run on four legs surely i should be able to make myself you know uh run on four legs and as we were talking, he showed me around his kind of workplace. Uh, it gets a bit gory now because we're going to look at some dissection. He was in the middle of dissecting a snow leopard. And I said, could we dissect a goat? Um, and he said, sure, if you bring me a dead goat. And so I started to think, where could I get a dead goat from? So I went back to the goat sanctuary and asked if I could have a goat and it died. Um, after some difficult conversations, they eventually agreed because there was a goat that was dying called Venus of a disease that they didn't um, that they didn't understand. And so they said, OK, you can dissect the goat as long as you get the vets um, at dissection to also um, tell us what the, this goat is dying from. And so Venus died. Unfortunately, she died on a Sunday. So she had to spend the night in my fridge. Uh, but the next day I took her to the, this lab and we kind of dissected this, um, this animal. And it was kind of a fascinating sort of process, a real kind of uh, visceral look at the difference between a kind of uh, evolutionary sort of version of a kind of of a mechanism and a uh, engineering version of a mechanism. So I realised, of course, that what I needed some expertise in was prosthetics. So I went to visit a prosthetics clinic and they agreed to make me some, some goat legs. Um, and while they were doing that, I tried to make myself a prosthetic rumen so I could not just eat grass, but also digest it. And that's a goat's rumen. And this is my kind of prosthetic version of it. Um, and again, I worked with some researchers at a room and biology lab to try and kind of work out how I could, you know, chew up some grass, spit it into one end of my um, prosthetic room and bag that would be strapped to my chest and then suck out this kind of, you know, uh, partially fermented, partially digested mixture from the other end. Um, and it all relied on some getting some rumen fluid from inside a goat that would then uh, sort of help to pre-digest this kind of grass. But eventually I put it all together and went to the Swiss Alps to try and live as a goat um, at this goat farm for six days. And I quickly realised that I was not a good goat. These goats, when they were being herded to another pasture, they just kind of disappeared into the distance um, each time. And my prosthetics were just really painful. Um, but, you know, I would just kind of plod along and eventually catch up to the goats in the, in the pasture um, and, you know, basically try and forget I was a human being. And uh, it was difficult and basically unpleasant. <laughs> um, the goats sort of accepted me, um, you know, towards the end um, and, uh, you know, just kind of run away 
and eventually I had to sort of I had this idea that I was going to try and cross the Alps um you know it prosthetics were actually much less painful as long as I kind of kept going uphill um but I should just quickly kind of mention you know I've been you know since that project trying to like work out what it was about and yes it was about trying to escape but there was something about it that I found difficult and I've realized and actually just watching that clip of the um the kind of virtual reality film that I made um you know uh which I sort of don't often talk about but just kind of watching that film you know there is this sort of underlying uh kind of this underlying um, idea that, you know, technology will keep developing and, you know, and that society will kind of keep progressing. Um, and, you know, this is, and GDP will kind of keep going up. Um, and I realized that one of the reasons why I found being a goat quite difficult was because it was kind of against this idea of progress um and it was against this idea of basically uh star trek and i realized i'd watched a lot of star trek when i was growing up um and you know soaked up this idea that yes there might be bumps along the road but you know space ultimately the final we're frontier. heading to the stars etc um, the... and you know the, we're kind of evolving as a species you know this kind of idea this false idea that evolution has a kind of has the direction has a trajectory um and uh yes and i realized that you know although i'm not kind of religious person i did have a kind of faith in progress a kind of faith in technology and science and you know and it, it you know arguably is sort of Know, it's a, a faith like any other um and the reason why people have faith according to Ernest Becker a kind of 70s sociologist is because we need to believe that we are part of something bigger part of this kind of timeline of you know you know sort of ancient sort of civilization progressing to kind of technical civilization or kind of part of religion or part of like the story of a nation um and the reason why we need to believe this is because with is because we can't kind of uh cope with this you know basically the idea that we're going to die um and the idea that we are also animal as well as this kind of amazingly uh, sort of aware being um or you know we can't cope with the idea that we are gods with anuses um so i'm aware that i've talked uh, for much too long um so i will leave it there but uh i hope that kind of came across <laughs> okay um right there we go thank you wonderful Thank you so much. Just made me a heart go bit. <laughs> yeah, Thank you so much. A, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Really moving. Thank you. And um, maybe we should start.